Welcome to class five on how to read the Bible. Um, today we're going to go over your work on word studies, and then I'm going to launch you into the final piece of the puzzle, which is exegesis, kind of tying that up, and application. So I wanted to start by just asking, how did it go with your word study? How'd that go? Raise your hand if you did a word study. Great. Congratulations. Raise your hand if that was your first word study to do. Most hands, if not all. Extra congratulations, because you know what? You just learned a new skill. I don't care how well or how poorly you did, you learned a new skill. And that's a big deal. And it's a little bit terrifying that, that that's your first word study, because then you're like, oh, how much can I do? It's kind of exciting. It's terrifying, like, how much you might have missed, but let's not think about the past. No, uh, how uncommon it is to learn a skill like that. But it's not something people could do throughout history. Think about what a concordance is. I mean, Jesus had the Isaiah scroll, right? Do you think he was passing that around in Nazareth? No. There was one. And they weren't doing word studies. They just read the text. So think of it like a technological advancement um, gift that you can do a word study. That's pretty cool, man. So, all right, how'd it go? Really intense. Intense? Oh, yeah. It was a good class. Yeah. Literally filled me up in a good way. Filled me up. Filled you up. Felt good. I kind of did a roadblock. It just seemed like the word I was studying, which was anger, was like a, I don't know if you call it a primary word, but there's like nothing else from it anywhere else in the other scriptures. So it was a little frustrating. Okay. Did, would you say that you felt angry? No, I mean, I felt <laughs> a little bit amused, a little bit frustrated, but I didn't yeah. understand the wisdom well enough to know where to go with it. Okay, yeah. I appreciate that humility and 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 honesty. Thank you for sure. So you studied anger, the word anger? Yeah. Okay. Angry. Angry. Okay. Okay. And uh, it's only used four times, and Paul's the only one that ever says it. So that was a good one to start with. <laughs> okay. So the, you're doing an Ephesians word study from chapter one on predestined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so that was a good one to go through yeah. the process. Uh huh. And, but on the flip side, mm -hmm. what was my third one? Uh, mystery. Oh my gosh. Did I do mystery? So you did yeah. three word studies. We well, did do. No, congratulations. That's great. Yeah. So you did mystery, predestined, and I, th I think uh, you only had to do power. power. That's, power. there's more, Lots there's more than four occurrences of power. Yeah, I know, but it is a lot easier when there's one number and they're all set by scripture. Yeah, it's easy in one sense. It's also hard because you're like, oh, I don't have a large data set. My wife's a, a rocket scientist by trade. Training, but her trade is stay-at-home mom. Rocket science was her backup plan. She's doing her plan A, which is being a mom, taking care of our kids and me. <laughs> that's, that's actually really difficult. But she taught me a lot about data, and she would go to the cyclotron. That's what they call it out in San Francisco. And, in fact, right after we were married, we took a trip for her work and to the cyclotron, and she spent, like, three days and all they do is throw ions at electronics and see how it disrupts them. Talk about data sets. That's like a whole nother level. Yeah, it looked like it was from the 1980s. I think it actually was from the 80s at the youngest. But anyway, it reminded me of on Lost, you know, when you go to the movie, the show Lost, they go down underground and there's this guy just, yeah, I'm not going to, yeah, season two, I think. Um, but anyway, the point is, there's a large data set that you need to get really good um, information. So sometimes it's, it is simpler, but maybe, maybe it's not always better to have a small data set. In the New Testament, um, well, I guess in Old Testament too, but there's this phrase called a hopox legomena. It's words that are only used once. 
hapax is once in Greek, and being said is like amina. So it's once being said. That's a thing. And it's actually at a disadvantage. So, for example, um, daily, in the phrase daily bread, you know, give us today our daily bread, is a hapax legamina in all of Greek literature. It's the, the, the daily word. We're not sure what that means. We think it's daily. You can look at the etymological breakdown of upon the day, and it's like that might be it, it might not. If you're aware of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the fallacy of, the, it's called the etymo etymology fallacy, where you break a word down, and Duvall and Hayes talked about that. But we don't know what it means. We think it means daily. It could mean, if you're reading Origen and his treatise on prayer, super substantial or spiritual bread. So that's one example of where we're at a disadvantage. A lot of Hebrew words are hapax legamina. And so we're like, we think it's this. Based on context, it's probably that. And that's where you, you can look into archaeological data. Um, there's a thing called epigrapha. And it's essentially like pieces of literature on old, like, pottery or coins. Um, and epigrapha can help you understand words that are only used in literature a few times. That's why archaeology and finding, it's like we found the, or the Rosetta Stone, for example, translated in three languages the same thing. Super helpful. So, anyway, that, that kind of gave me a launching point to talk about. So thank you for sharing that. How else did it go with you all? So you ran into some barriers, some success, pretty good? Okay, vow. What, what kind of barriers did you run into with vow? Uh, so for those who aren't aware, the word vow is used in Jonah when the sailors vowed vows, um, was it after they threw Jonah into the sea? Okay, and then Jonah used the word vow. Okay, so. Uh, it was the hard part was how like we could read that instrument. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to like find how to get depth from it. And it was very, like almost straightforward. Uh, but there's a lot of good context around it that helped me kind of differentiate a couple of different types of vows. Okay. And did you look up the word vow and then other variations or just vow? Uh, all the variations. So I looked at vow like the name vow. Vow, vowed, yeah. It gets a little tricky when it's like seek, sought. Yeah, you can do, it's, it can get a little tricky there. Forsake, forsaken. So there's, you're going to run into barriers when you do word studies, period. When, I mean, even if you know the languages, but we're doing English-only word studies, so you're already in a vulnerable state, right? Because you're like, but that's not what it's... But just remember, I'm, I'm trying to give you a tool, but I want you guys to be humble with it and treat it lightly. So this, having some of the data, doing some of the research yourself, gives you a leg to stand on but also, when you read commentaries, you can say, oh, they know Greek, they know Hebrew, and they're giving me more substance, they're giving me more richness. But what I'm giving you is better than nothing, and it can be very substantial, depending on the word. It's like, Chad, just, just give me black and white. It's like, it's not black and white, man. So I want you to feel comfortable in the gray, in, in dancing with it, by just... Another thing that's really helpful is the parallel passages that you come across when you're doing a word study. You're like, oh, interesting, same phrase. Not only the same word, the same phrase. So that's really good. Some, uh, I want to get some more feedback from you all. How did it go? Maybe even like, hey, I had this problem. Can you help me with that? Sure. Earl. Yeah. You were talking about how in Hebrew, in the old Hebrew, I guess, there are real, I don't know, rudimentary kind of 
phrases, mm -hmm. that you should just leave a lot, a lot out. There's a lot of room for interpretation. Mm -hmm. Is this the sort of thing that, that would apply to, to interpreting that about what the intent or the, um, the spiritual, you know, if somebody just says something that's two or three words like that, how do you really get the, the uh, abstract, I guess, maybe, um, meaning? Yeah, how do you get the meaning? Really, the best we can ever do with the meaning of any word is context. And so, you know, let's say there's a, there's a, uh, there's a Hebrew word that's only used once. Or just a few times, and you're like, well, ah. Or, or it's like predestined. The more you need to go into the context. And that's where, it, funny enough, the more vague a certain term is, the more important your book study is. What is the overall theme? So, for example, um, we're about to do a, a class in Romans that's going to start here in about a month. There's a verse in Romans 11 that says, and thus all Israel will be saved. Whoa, dude. That's incredible. So in the end times, all ethnic Jews are going to essentially be saved. That's one interpretation. But, but I reject that interpretation categorically because of my understanding of Romans as a whole where Paul redefines who Israel is, that word out of context could mean that. But I believe, it, it, like people can make a strong argument, and we'll go through that in the class, why they might think all ethnic Jews will be favored in any fashion after Christ. You can make an argument for that. I can make a stronger argument, I would say, why that's anti-gospel. Now, well, we could have a good discussion about it, but context determines meaning. So what, what's interesting, Earl, is you can actually have one author use one word in two different ways, depending on context. So how do you interpret those kind of words? Um, you know, you need to understand the big picture, and then the immediate context is really important, too. So predestined is a great example. Hopefully we'll, we'll be able to have some good discussion about that. So one of my issues when I got into it was like, trying to keep an open mind because I already had, I already have in my head uh -huh. what predestination is okay. and how it applies. And it's like, no, don't, don't do that. Don't go there. I just see what it says. So. That's a tricky one. So can I ask where you started and where you landed? Uh, I started that we're all predestined. Okay. Yeah, that's good. It kind of brought up way to go to put your presuppositions to the side. That's very difficult. So that's a huge deal that you were able to do that and say, what does it actually say? N.T. Wright says, few people want to know what the Bible actually says. And that's true, man, because we don't want to be challenged. We don't want our presuppositions to be researched. We want to have, you know, we want to kind of be able to hold it. But God's word is, is like his spirit sometimes in the journey of discerning what it means. It's kind of like the wind. Now, it's also like bread, and it's also like a pillar. So I'll let you deal with that. But, yeah, uh, Jim had his hand up first. And then Colin. Real quick, um, just so I'm super clear, he wants to stick to English only mm -hmm. now. And let's put aside the Greek and the Hebrew uh -huh. and the depth yeah. going forward. If we the, get this down, we'll be good. That's right, yeah. If you're going to learn the languages, I want you to spend two or three years on it. Yeah, and, and here's, let me just reiterate why. You either need to learn the language, just like you need to learn a book contextually, you need to learn a language contextually. So at Asbury, I was fortunate that their philosophy of language acquisition for seminarians was that, like, there's some seminaries out there who teach you how to use the tools, which is, you know, Logos and Accordance and some of these Bible software tools where you click on a word and then you can see what it means in the dictionary and you can learn how to apply it and then you can do, you can do a concordance word study based on the Greek and Hebrew, but you don't actually learn the language. 
Like you don't know how to just read the language and understand and remember the words and break down the, um, the different uh, conjugations and declensions. In other words, um, Hebrew, for example, is a suffixal language. So when, when you want to make it a woman or a man who does a verb or a they, you add a suffix to the end of a verb. Well, you have to learn how to do that. And by the way, you have to learn what the vowel points mean. And it's very kind of detailed, right? In Greek, you know, it's more sophisticated than Hebrew in a sense. And so you have to learn, well, how do the, how do the tenses of the Greek word change? Well, if you just learn how to use the Bible software, which is what you could do, then I think you really risk abusing the language because you don't understand the nuances. Um, you would really have more of a textbook knowledge, but out on the streets, man, it's like you're going to get mugged kind of thing. <laughs> it's like, I just don't want you to get mugged. Just don't go into the streets, okay? <laughs> um, if you go into the streets, it's kind of like when, when you have a gun. You need to know how to use a gun if you go in one. It's more dangerous to own a gun and not be trained in it because the gun is a bullet magnet, okay? So I just want you guys to be trained in what you do. And maybe there's one or two of you called by God to go into those languages. Go for it. If that's not you, just say that's not me. And don't try and kind of muddle your way through it. I think the danger of doing that is greater than the English-only word, word study fallacy. So either way, it's a risk. So again, whenever you're like, okay, I want to do a word study, make the first step of just taking that verse and seeing how five translations translate it. You are uncovering the Greek and Hebrew by eliciting five translation committees, unless it's the message and then it's just Eugene Peterson. But other than that, so think of it like this. If this is a, if this is a word and all you can see when you look down on this word is one point, okay? Then you're like, oh, what does that mean? When you understand how a word can be used, it's like opening up the flower petals of, it's called semantic range. Semantic range means what are all the possible meanings? So let me write that down for you. Semant you've heard, it's, it's, oh, that's just semantics. People are talking about the meaning of words. Well, semantics are actually really helpful, by the way. <laughs> so if someone says that's just semantics, I think that's a cop out in the argument. Semantics are actually really important because they uncover the possible meanings of a word. And what translations can, if you know Greek and Hebrew, you, <laughs> if you know them well, and I would consider my knowledge intermediate of both of the languages. Um, my Greek's definitely better than, than Hebrew, but um, I haven't studied classical Greek at this point, and I haven't studied Akkadian and Ugaritic, which are other Sem Semitic languages that you need to underst better understand Hebrew. So <laughs> I'm not even uh, an expert, okay? But those who are, are prolific, or maybe in a certain area, like for, for example, um, maybe they just know one word. They know all what the flower petals could be of that word's possible meanings. And then they can be like, oh, well, it's this one, you know. What a translation does is it goes ahead and tells you, well, it's either this one or that one. And you don't have to know all the possible meanings. You can just look at, well, translators are kind of divided. It's either this one or that one. And, and then you can say context. And you're pretty much on par, you know, as far as on a literary level with, with everyone else. There's a great pastor in Kentucky named Billy Henderson. And he, uh, Colin knows him. He, he pastors a church there. He's been a pastor for 30, 40 years, one of those kind of guys. He's in his 60s. He doesn't know Greek and Hebrew. He barely knows English. No. <laughs> he, he's a humble man. And he is okay with it. He even preaches out of the KJV. God bless his soul. Oh, yeah. No. Um, <laughs> uh, but his ability to discern the heart of God and interpret scripture is on par with 
with most people I know who know Greek and Hebrew, like most pastor level kind of people. So I'm just trying to encourage you in the English only thing. It, it's really great. And then, um, so there's two things to temper the word only, uh, the English only word study fallacy. Number one is start with five translations and that'll give you a sense for the New Testament or Old Testament semantic range. And then, at the end of your word study, depending on the amount of time you have, do a concept study. And so, that was probably the most vague part of what you did. I hope, I hope my clarification in the email was helpful, but a concept study is saying, okay, there's a word, but what about the theme or the topic or other words like it that I can't, it's not vow or vowed, it's promise or something. It's not even related to that word. Then, then you can start to really understand at a deeper level. And I think if you combine all that together, the word study proper, so the initial preliminary translation scan, the word study proper, and then a concept study, I think you're going to be in pretty good shape. All right, what else did you guys run into? Successes, wins, insights? I want to hear it. Yeah, Trey. I looked at uh, Jonah 3.10 and uh, in the King James Version. It says that God saw their works, that they turned from their evil ways, and God repented of the evil I'd never thought of God having to repent before. Uh -huh. So that was a little bit of a, a, a eye opener for me. But uh, in the uh, different translations I looked at, it's change his mind, relent, repent. So yeah. yeah. So so how did how did you land on that? Well, I I landed on relent rather than. Mm -hmm. of uh, not thinking that uh, God would have to repent yeah. based on the how I understand the word. Yeah, that's really helpful, Tracy. So um, repent, have you heard of connotation and denotation? Have we talked about this? Okay, so there's the connotation of the word repent, which is like, oh, like they sinned. But then there's the denotation which is what it actually means. Okay? Repent means to change one's mind, to turn around. It doesn't necessarily mean that you were sinning by going in the opposite direction. So translation matters because when we read English words, <laughs> when we read any words, they connote something. They make us feel a certain way. They bring to mind certain things that may not accord with their denotation. And so relent is not a common English word, but I think it, I also agree that it fits better. So again, in Jonah 3.10, it says, when God saw, this is NIV, saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, talking about the Ninevites, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Well, that sounds a lot different than, and God repented, right? The connotation of repent it is different than the denotation. So relent is like, oh, what does that mean? Change one's mind. They, they sit better in that context. So that's great, man. Thanks for bringing that up. So I slammed the KJV. Let me explain that. The KJV had only five manuscripts in 1611. We have many more. They call extant manuscripts. We have many more available manuscripts to see what was the earliest. And some of the ones with the KGB were, were really late. And we have better manuscripts. Um, also, we have more archaeological evidence. We have the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's incredible information and data that we didn't have before to better interpret some of those hapax, legomena, and other cultural issues. So. Mm -hmm. I literally stopped and told me, you know, that's mm -hmm. not really the Bible. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I didn't really understand yeah. at that point, but he literally thought yeah. God told the scribe word yeah. for word what to write. Yeah. And now, you know, your point's well taken that that was done what, 400 years before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Were found. So how could that theory hold? Yeah, I think I think it really, the KJV only people. Um, and if that's you, like, let's talk. I, I, I'm actually trying to win you over. Um, number one, just the data. But also, I think, I think we need to understand that God inspired the autographs. God inspired the original documents. But he did not inspire the translators in the same way. I hope that the Holy Spirit carried them. But um, I think it goes to show how dogmatic we can be about our own interpretation and our own background. Maybe you grew up on the KJV, and so you hold on, you know, that's probably me with the NIV 1984. <laughs> no, no, 2011. <laughs> that's not the Bible. You know, we could turn the ESV into that. I mean, this is, this is God's translation for our time, even. That's not how it works, man. So um, I think we need to hold lightly our interpretations because that's all they are. In other words, when you preach and teach and disciple, Hold God's word high, and your interpretation lower. <laughs> Gives you a dose of humility. Well, God's word says it. It's like, it's your interpretation of God's word. Now, you might be right, but you might be wrong. In other words, when, you're, when you start using the Bible as a battering ram, you need to check yourself. Because God's word should speak for itself, and it should be pretty clear when you're that dogmatic. When things are not that clear, you should be less dogmatic. When you're the only one who believes something, tone it down. Maybe don't say anything for a little while. Figure out if you're right through prayer, fasting, and study. And then talk to your your pastoral leadership. And if you still don't agree, go to the elders and let them help you. And maybe if you're right, you'll help them be won over as well. That humility is really important. Um, When we teach Romans, when I teach Romans, um, the elders know that I have a different position than what they would teach on some of the core doctrine of Romans. And they said, it's okay for you to teach your perspective. And by the way, it's not like unique to me. They said, it's okay if you teach your perspective. It's called, um, it's part of a new wave of scholarship since the 1970s. So it's, it's been around for about 50 years. Some of the things that I believe. But they said, we want you to teach the perspective also that other people have traditionally held. And that's totally legit, right? So it's when you <laughs> start getting in your own little world. Like uh, Ben Witherington one time, unfortunately, uh, this was like kind of weird, but he was like, he talked about Paul's wife. And I was like, uh, Paul wasn't married. He presented an argument that it was likely Paul was married and that she had died. Perhaps they got a divorce, but more likely that she had died because Jews, Jewish men would get married. Like, if you didn't get married, it was kind of (laughs) weird. That's why John the Baptist and Jesus were kind of weird. And so he's like, Paul was likely married. And so then he he said, and so Paul's wife, and I was like, (laughs) we don't know that. (coughs) To me, that was crossing a line, okay? Now, he's a biblical scholar, and he teaches at seminary. He can do whatever he wants, but uh, to me, that was crossing a line. All right, what else? This is fun. This is good. This is your opportunity to learn, grow, celebrate, give some insights, be challenged, present your challenges. What else? So which verse in Psalm 22 is it? Psalm 22, 18. Let me just read that. Thank you for talking about this, by the way. So um, I just, just so everyone can track with us. Um, they pierced. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so it's 16. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. 
They have pierced my hands and my feet. George, you get into studying this, I went to the virgins first. Uh, okay. They all had an asterisk before okay. what I did. Uh, they were pierced, and they have uh, the Torah and Septuagint have it as like a lion. And I didn't do it. I'm not going to understand how pierced translates to like a lion. So then I went to the uh, complete Jewish Bible. Okay. Dogs are all around me. A pack of villains closes in on me like a lion at my hands and feet. So it's totally changed. <laughs> <laughs> the meaning is pretty for me. Yeah. So it's, it's how he was feeling when he was describing, you know. Yeah. So if I may recall for the class, towards the beginning, uh, I think it was session two of this class, Mark and I got into a dialogue during class about the theological meaning of Psalm 22. And I said, well, let's wait on theological principalizing and let's talk about the original intent. And you're like, well, but we know the psalmist wasn't pierced. So I was trying to say, let's go deeper into it. And Mark was so humble to let me guide him in that way. And we actually had a phone call a few days later. And I said, let's, and then Mark was like, okay, I understand what you're saying. He misunderstood kind of what I was saying, where he, where I was actually saying, like, I totally want you to do what you want to do, but first, let's talk about the original intent. And your humility, I believe, has led you to looking at the original intent, okay, the flower of meaning possibilities, and one interpretation of the Hebrew and the Greek, they're kind of like, well, we don't know. And one is, um, what did you call it, like a bear? Like a lion. Like a lion. Totally different. Now... So wh how did you end up doing your word study after you figured that out, that difference out? So I was trying to determine um, like how it was used. So a physical act was done ten times. Um, and, and which word did you actually study? Pierced. Okay. So then you went to pierced. Okay. And then a physical act to Jesus three times. Uh -huh. uh, remembering the physical act done to Jesus twice. A feeling. Like she was pierced metaphorically yeah. in her heart, yeah. It's just a, a flat description. Okay. So I was trying to determine, okay, how else is it used in the Bible to determine mm -hmm. what <laughs> in this yeah. context? And so were all those in the New Testament? Uh, no, some of those are in the Old Testament. Okay, what were, I know I'm putting you on the spot if you're willing to dialogue about it. 526 pierced his temple. Which, which verse reference? Judges 5. 26, so it's like a physical act, it's got like a slash figure, pierced his temple, so there's a spike. Oh, yeah, yeah, in Judges 5, um, is it Jael uh, was pierced in his temple by Deborah? Okay, so pierced physically, all right. So that's kind of one example. There's a couple more in the Old Testament like that? Okay. Okay. So they're all physical piercings and then, and then Job twenty six thirteen, by his breath the skies became fair, his hand pierced his lion's serpent. Okay. So again it's some sort of physical, maybe metaphorical or yeah. or um, allegorical. Um, okay. So that's a way way to observe. By the way, Mark did a great job saying, like, even observing how the English Bible was noted. When there's really big differences or translational issues, there's a little italics B in my NIV, and you go to the bottom, and it says, like he was saying, some Hebrew manuscripts. So, in other words, some Hebrew manuscripts have pierced. Septuagint and Syriac um, are the same. Most Hebrew manuscripts are like the lion. So they, the NIV translators chose to translate it in one way, whereas they could have done another way. And I believe the NIV, who has a translation where it's not pierced? What does yours say? Mine says my hands and feet have shriveled. Have shriveled, okay. So this is where you get into 
do you actually interpret something theologically? And I think that there's a justification in a Christian Bible to translate it pierced because of how New Testament interpretation reads Psalm 22. There's an argument to be made that it shouldn't be pierced because that's a theological appropriation or leaning. Like if you've kind of got two options and you go with more of a theological meaning, okay, that's one way to do it. But if you go with more of the plain meaning, uh, perhaps, and I haven't done a, a, a linguistic analysis of it, so I'm kind of guessing a little bit here on what the, the difficulty was. But a less theological translation would, would probably say lion, assuming all the data was the same. Do you see what I'm saying? So, um, so I, I think you're, you're, each one has its own right. Um, but that does change the interpretation of it. Cool. Thanks, Mark. I'm glad that that was helpful for you. All right, what else? Okay, so Colin studied fear. He wanted to pick a hapax legomenon, so he picked fear. It was only used once in the Bible, right? How, how many? Uh, Old Testament was 277. 277, so, yeah. And the New Testament. We have a lot of data to work with. Yeah, that's true. Okay, like physical fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah it, it seems like it's the anxiety, but as a result, like, could be a harm somehow. Okay. But it's like you have that present a lot, but then you have fear of the Lord. Uh huh. And so that's where it's like uh, mm. most Moses can say, "Do not be afraid, but fear the Lord." So it's like a little bit of a semantic range, like it's like okay, so it's like how do you understand the difference between both of them? Mm hmm. And how they translate over. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. And there is scripture I, I should look at here where God applies those kind of things to fear the Lord. Uh-huh. Uh it's like do you not fear me, says the Lord, do you not tremble before me. Uh my flesh trembles for fear of you, I'm afraid of your judgment. Who considers the power of your anger? Your wrath is as great as as the fear that has seized you. And so it's it still seems like uh the fear Yeah, like he ha he, it seems like fear generally used almost most often relates to someone being afraid of someone else's power to harm them in uh -huh. some, or, or judge them. Mm -hmm. And yeah. like that same kind of fear can be applied to the Lord. To the Lord. But in, he says, like elsewhere, uh, he, he wants to put the fear of him in their hearts so that they might not. Mm. And it's like, so that might go well with yeah. It. Yeah, there's almost an extension. There's, there's like, one of the things you can do with a word study is not just the meaning, but the result. Mm -hmm. Or the con. you can kind of put a word in buckets. Like, like for example, it could be, um, you probably noticed this, fear of man. Yep. And then fear of God. Yep. And then fear of danger. Mm -hmm. You know, stuff like that. So you can start putting, when you do a word study, you can start kind of thinking creatively. Okay, there's, there's certain things that you can be afraid of happening to you. There's certain objects of fear. And then you can start to get fodder for teaching. Like, let's say you wanted to just teach topically on fear in the Bible. You could be like, a lot of people fear, this has danger, by the way, in Chad speak. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is that what that says? I don't even know what it says anymore. <laughs> you could fear danger of things. You could fear people, and you could fear God. You got a three-point lesson right there. And then you could ask the Holy Spirit when you're doing your word study, which verses do you want me to focus on to talk about each of those? You got a, you got a lesson from your word study just like that. You want to disciple your kids or your grandkids, you, but you're doing a word study. Tell them about your word study. Share a few scriptures from it. Yeah, all right. Keep, thanks for letting me interrupt you. No, no, yeah. It, it is interesting trying to figure out how to... Because the general fear is like, okay, like, 
Moab was uh, in dread because they feared the people. Sure, that's in my body. That's what they're experiencing that anxiety of us being harmed by the people. Mm -hmm. But the, the tricky one was like, how, how do you properly understand fear of the Lord? Like fear mm -hmm. of God? Because fear happens three times in Jonah. Okay, so re would you read or tell us a little bit about fear in Jonah? Like, yeah. yeah. So, so that we can know kind of where you were going with it. So it hap you see fear happens three times in Jonah. Okay. All in the event of uh, Jonah was disobeyed. So the first time is when uh, the storm happens. It, it just says the sailors were afraid and he cried out to his own. Okay. Uh, so that's the first one. Like they were afraid of the storm. He just cried out to his own God. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's the first one. And so how did, if I may stop yeah. you, how, that it's not the word fear, but it's afraid. How did you kind of think through this? this concept study? Because oftentimes, like, fear is, is a conjunction with other words, like afraid and dread okay. and whatnot. So oftentimes I might lump in, like, it's afraid for fear, and it's like this general sense. So did you do a word study on fear in the Bible, but then when you did a concept study in Jonah, you, you played with fear and afraid? I think so. Okay, something like that. Yeah, uh, because it is a bit of Sometimes. Sometimes it's just a rabbit hole and you don't know what happened. Uh, <laughs> You're like, how did I get here? Okay. And then the second occurrence uh, is when Jonah says, uh, I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, made the sea and dry land. Uh, and when the men heard this, they were even more afraid. So they were again, just afraid. So the sailors are afraid. The Old Testament, like fear, it's dealt with trembling, like afraid of things. Mm -hmm. like yep. it's, always, it's always associated with that feeling as well. Yeah. Uh, and so that, that was the second time again, like, they became more afraid when they figured out when they figured out that Jonah served Yahweh. Like, wait, oh, wait, what? You served him, and that's why this is happening. Yeah. Uh, and the third and final time, which is what sparked this, was when uh, Jonah's like, "Hey, here's the solution: throw me overboard, and the sea will calm." They're like, "No, we won't do that." Eventually, they do it, and the sea calms. And that's where it says. So they move from fearing danger to fearing, to fearing the Lord and then to really fearing the Lord more because they got to know his power. Yeah, so that, that's where it moves from like a general fear uh -huh. and then goes to that. And then they fear the Lord. To a specific fear. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah, that's really helpful. But that's where like, what does fear the Lord mean? Mm -hmm. And almost, I don't want to say all the times, but most often fear the Lord implied that you're now following him in his statue wholeheartedly serving him. What, like, that's what it means to fear the Lord is to stop sinning and to uh -huh. follow him. Yeah. That's really, it's sparked because like, okay, did they start committing their lives to Yahweh? Uh -huh. Or was it just like a, a general fear as it relates to who he is? Like, oh, he just terrifies us. Or is it like, <laughs> oh no, I now serve you kind of fear. Uh -huh. That's where it's tricky. And they yeah. vowed vows. So yeah. where'd, you, where'd you, and they made sacrifices. So where'd you land so initially, when I first started studying, like, I don't think they made, the, made like, a vow of sacrifice proper. Like, oh, we're now going to be, like, a, what, what's the word for a Gentile who would... Uh, a proselyte. Yeah, I was like, I don't think they're proselytes. But I think maybe at the end of it. Uh, just through all the reading, and it helped us from a general mm -hmm. fear to fear the Lord, and then it's three times translation. That's Eugene Peterson. That's how he would interpret it. Uh, was that they worship they worshipped. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think it, it could be, mm -hmm. again, open-handed, light-handed. Yeah. That they did. It was like, a, oh, we fear the Lord now. Well, and it's the language used, I think, is pejorative of the author of Jonah. Period. Because pejorative means kind of poking at you. Mm. So I think the Jews are reading Jonah and being like, sailors? Like, we all know sailors then they're gentiles it, it starts to use conversion language of gentiles before a, the whole the worst city it's like sailors are pretty bad but nineveh and it's almost like they're warming the author is warming them up to conversion language for gentiles into yahweh fearing people and it kind of teases you it's kind of like the author you know uh, of the gospel of john Well, what happened with Nicodemus? Did he convert or not? Give me the answer. It's a little riddle for you. Well, who was the audience of John? It was, it was 
It was Jews and Gentiles, but it was very Jewish. So who's the author, of, who's the audience of Jonah? It's Jews, right? And the whole point of Jonah has to do with bringing the Gentiles in. So that's really interesting. Do we know? We don't know. But what Colin's saying is doing that word study helped give you evidence to say, but maybe. And in fact, you know, some people would say it's likely that at least some of them were. It's kind of like, well, I, one of my questions about Jonah is, well, what did the Ninevites do? Did they become God-fearers? No, I haven't done the historical research. I would, I would read a commentary to find out more on that, by the way. Um, to know the, the fate of the Ninevites. What, you know, did, did they become Jews? I don't, I don't know. Like, to look at the history would be really interesting to me. So, what else did you find? I mean, not much outside. I know the New Testament, there's a lot of things in there. Yeah. I know what we're doing with the Old Testament, we're doing with Jonah. Uh-huh. Uh, which that's why I started to see. I didn't want to transpose New Testament yeah. into that. Uh, but that, it's a deep one. Uh, yeah. So, let me just pause right, right there. So, you could do an Old Testament word study and look at all the New Testament terms like Mark did. And there's value in that, especially for pierced. Because it helps you understand why there would be a, uh, a theological interpretation of that. But you could also say and hold that lighter. Remember the, the order. If you're doing an Old Testament word, right, the New Testament wasn't written yet. So you, would, you could consider that data theologically, but you hold it way lighter. So look at um, how is that word used by that author in their corpus. Let's say we knew that the author of Jonah wrote other things. So for Moses, we know that he wrote the first five books. So you could look at how does Moses use, you know, uh, yom, the word for day, in Genesis, how does he use it in Deuteronomy, for example, right? So that holds more weight. And then you look at the, the actual canon. Uh, so you look at the Testament and then the canon. The canon is all of Scripture. So Testament comes before that. That's what Colin's saying. I just want to make sure you guys were tracking Mm-hmm. And he's like, and, and I am your shield. Like, I, I, I'm your protection. That's what, that's, that's when he says, like, don't be afraid of them. Like, you serve me, fear me. Like, you're going to be good. Like, it, it'll go well with you because it keeps you in our relationship. Mm-hmm. So that's where it's like, the fear of the Lord actually drives you closer to him. Mm-hmm. Whereas this is like general fear kind of just paralyzes you. Yeah. Depending. And I think, yeah, it, depending on your heart's willingness, too. Mm-hmm. So the fear, it turned from fear of, like, stay away to fear of we want to move close when they experience a personal encounter or I guess a <laughs> however you define that but yeah it's still kind of synthesizing yeah it's, just, it's yeah. good so what I encourage you to do is make a, con- a tentative conclusion based on what you currently understand and then if you have time to go back to it or someone presents a new argument then reassess but go ahead and make a tentative conclusion and say I think the sailors were converted. Can't prove it, yeah. but I think so. Earl. Does it play, is there a play then in Jonah that is what you're talking about, where it might go from being afraid of God to turning it around? Um, was it 2 8? Jonah 2 8. Which verse again? Um, I think it's Jonah 2, 2. Yeah, in my distress, so Jonah's inside the belly of the whale. In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. So you're... you're, you're 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I mean, you say you, you use the word distress, and you just wonder from a from a from a translation standpoint. Mm -hmm. You know, because of, you could have said you said in my fear for my situation. Yeah, that's a good question. So what you, what I would suggest you do is if that's you're like, huh, that's interesting. You could just look at different translations, and if no one says it's fear, it's probably distress. And you can be pretty confident in that, that that's a good translation, and that fear is, is something different. Maybe he really was stressed out or pressed down kind of thing. But when you do a concept study, you could start playing with that idea of the correlations between fear and stress. Yep. And, and then you could decide, you know, wh what's, what's the author doing here at a literary level? Cool. Anyone else want to share? I have a question. Yep. So, uh, initially approach, uh, you use the five versions, I guess, of mm -hmm. the Hasmetic range, and then context, focus context for each one. Then work into the concept study. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the process. That's correct. Okay. Yep, that's the process. Your concept study comes after your word study. Questions? Jim. Um, is there, I made a mistake. When we first started the class, you gave us the thing, how to study the Bible. And I went ahead and did it all at once. It was like, bum, 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 got all the steps done. It's like, oh, cool. Um, now breaking it down was really helpful. I'm just wondering, is there a, uh, a study guide that you conduct your Bible study that just breaks it out like that? You can just go through book after book, you know, as an exercise manual. Uh, that's interesting. Um, that That's something I've thought about writing. Um, but in the meantime, let me um, share with you some recommended resources on your syllabus. David Bauer and Robert Trena's book, Inductive Bible Study, subtitle, A Comprehensive Guide to the Practice of Hermeneutics. That's going to be as close as you can get to what you're asking for. Um, I think what Jim was saying, is there is there like a guide where you, it'd be like Jonah, and then it has the text, and then you read it, and then you write it down, almost like a workbook kind of thing. That's a great idea. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about writing something like that. But in the meantime, Inductive Bible Study. David Bauer taught me at Asbury, and he was, he was a machine. We did Matthew for a whole semester. It's unbelievable how deep this goes. If you think God's word is holy, just study it systematically, and it'll go up a notch. It does not denigrate God's word to study it intensely and intently. It elevates it. And the rabbit hole only gets more rich, more complex, and more enlivening. I'm telling you, man, it's exciting stuff. So let's, let's go into some word studies that I did. Um, I want to share with you some of my work. And I want to tie up some loose ends, give you some sort of anecdotal teaching. So this will be, be interesting. Um, and then I want to give you some parallel passages work that's not part of your study, but it, it's, it's like a side tangent. And then I want to share with you how to do the last step, which is application, exegesis and application. Um, and part of what I want to do right now is show you my process ending with the concept study, because I think that that's where it gets more artful. It's not quite as study, create buckets, and then make a conclusion. It's like, what do you mean concept study? <laughs> so let's talk through that. Um, I had a really good time with the word concern. So I did the same experiment you guys did. I used English only. In fact, I never looked up the Greek and Hebrew on these words. that I, I did one in each book just to see how it worked. I wanted to test it. So let me read how concerned is used. Um, I believe it's used 
30 some odd times. I want to say 36. No, that's forsaken. It was used a decent number of times in the Old Testament. Just the English word concerned. So I looked it up in the different translations from Jonah chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Let me read that just so you have some, some perspective on where we're going with it. Jonah 4, 10 and 11. But the Lord said, this is the very end of Jonah. You have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? So there's this contrast that I was interested in between Jonah's concern for a plant and God's concern for people. I thought it was really important to the meaning of Jonah. So when you pick a word study, try and pick things that are important or interesting to you. Listen to the Holy Spirit as you pick your word. Don't pick a word from your flesh where you could be smart or you could be, you could, you know, pick a word that you think God is leading you down or that's important for maybe the people you're teaching or yourself. So maybe it's not important for someone else, but you're like, I'm really interested in this for my own spiritual nourishment or confusion. That's how you pick, okay? So I picked concern because I thought it was important. And so this is just partial data. I thought these were good representations of the data that I looked at. Um, and so I looked at, and I did my five translations. The NIV and the NRSV said concerned. The ESV and KJV said pity. You've had pity on this plant. Should I not have pity on these people? The NLT said feel sorry. And the message said change your feelings from pleasure to anger. I think I did six translations. Should I, sh uh, you know, should you, you have changed your feelings from pleasure to anger about this plant, is how Eugene Peterson translated it. So I picked concerned. I could have picked pity, but I wanted to do concerned. And I did it in the NIV. Genesis 21, 11, the master distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. Like, it was about his son. Exodus 2, 25. So all of these notes are in, uh, in the PDF. So you could kind of read this later if you want or follow along. Or just listen and you've got it later. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. He cared. He had pity. He, he was concerned about them. Exodus 3, 7. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people. I am concerned about their suffering. Exodus 4.31, and when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshiped. So I'm starting to gather the subject is God and he is concerned uh, in these last three cases with people's suffering. 1 Samuel 22.8, is that why you have all conspired against me? No one tells me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is concerned about me or tells me that my son has incited my servant to lie and wait for me as he does today. No, none of you is concerned for my physical well-being, the king says. 2 Samuel 13, 33. My lord, the king, should not be concerned about the report that all the king's <laughs> sons are dead. Only Ammon is dead. Concerned, uh, worried. Not so much care for someone, but worried about a report. First Chronicles 27.1. This is the list of the Israelites, heads of family, commanders, all who served the king, uh, who served the king in all that concerned the army divisions that were on duty month by month throughout the year. Each division consisted of 24,000 men. So concerned meaning sort of like with regard to. Okay. So those are some of the data pieces. Um, and so just some conclusions. 
Genesis 21, 11 was covenantal concern in context. He was, Esau was Abraham's concern. It was also covenantal with regard to the Hebrews in Exodus 2, 3, and 4. God was concerned about the covenant faithfulness, his own covenant faithfulness to the people. And suffering is the concern there. Saul, Saul's concern about Saul's own existence was what he was worried about in 1 Samuel 22. So the subject of con- concern is Saul. Whereas with the others, it was God. And David should not be concerned in 2 Samuel 13 about someone who had not died. One, one that we didn't read, but Psalm 142.4, no one is concerned for the psalmist's life in contrast with God as the refuge. So it's very physical. Then a couple that were interesting to me. Ezekiel 36.9 my note about that was that God's concerned to revive the mountains of Israel as they come home to be covenantally restored. What I'm discovering is that there's covenantal language associate, context associated with the word concerned. And when we think about Jonah, the covenant is at stake. God's covenant with the people is threatened by new, God being concerned about people that aren't Israel? Because in In the Bible, God's concerned when God's the subject and he's concerned about something. It's covenantal. Daniel 10.1 means with regard to, so it's just kind of, it's irrelevant. So here's my conclusion from the Old Testament word study. And I I had a few dozen contexts. It's generally used in covenantal context about Israel. Israel's leaders... Or Israel's land. And it's to express care for their physical and maybe sometimes spiritual life. So it's like, you know. So then I made a conclusion. So there's a general word study conclusion about kind of summarizing your findings. Writing out in a sentence or a few sentences your buckets of meaning in the Old Testament for that word, then take that and say, and in Jonah 4, 10, and 11, Jonah is concerned about the well, I'm just summarizing how the word's used and how I can use that word study to apply it. Jonah is concerned about the well-being of the, I wrote the planet, Uh, I meant plant, the well-being of a plant, but what about the, at least the animals, but even more the people? It's implicit that God's interested in their spiritual, even covenantal redemption. So what I realized in doing my word study is that God was concerned about the mountains of Israel. In Ezekiel 36, 9. And so why are the cattle mentioned in Jonah? That God's concerned about the cattle. And here was my conclusion. Jonah's worried about a plant, which is the lowest level of life form. The next level of life form up is animals, right? Then the next level is people. And God's like, you're worried about this plant. What about the people and at least the animals? I think that's the connotation of what God's trying to tell Jonah. And I discovered it through a word study. Because God was concerned about the mountains of Israel. Then I did a concept study in Jonah. So this is just what I wrote. Um, I, don't, I don't know how to teach a concept study, except I'm just going to show you what I did. So hopefully that will help. What I did is I said, okay, I did the word study. Now I'm going to go, and with this sense of God being concerned about the people in a covenantal sort of way, especially their physical, maybe spiritual well-being. Now, let me look at Jonah as a whole for that concept. And I wrote, God's care and compassion for people is sort of the, the header. Jonah's problem is that he didn't care about pagans perishing. 
He slept during the storm at sea, even though in Jonah 1.6, they were going to perish. He was willing to perish, but God saved him into the fish. Then his heart began to change toward the other, like other people. Like the sailors, the Ninevites had hope that they would not perish. Jonah knew, in other words, what's at stake for God's concern of people is that he doesn't want them to perish or physically suffer as the kind of most basic meaning. Thinking about the Israelites in, um, in Egypt. Jonah knew what was at issue was God extending his covenantal faithfulness to non-Jews. Jonah 4.2. He cared so much about his own life that his concern for Nineveh was below zero. God challenges Jonah to care for the Ninevites like he does. With covenantal overtones. And here's here's why I think there's covenantal overtones. Does anyone know where this comes from? Jonah 4, verses 2, 1 and 2. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is it not what I said when I was still at home? In other words, they had just repented. This is exactly what I thought would happen. And that was why I was so quick to flee Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God. Where does this come from? Slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Where does that come from? Who knows? It comes from when Moses sees God, God's glory in Exodus 34. Exodus 34. Good job, Colin. Good job, Dirk. It says, it's, it's, yeah, so he starts with his name in verse 6. Exodus 34, 6. It says, and he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Notice what Jonah left out. Slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. He got the first part, uh, compassion, compassionate and gracious, uh, I think he even had slow to anger, but he left out abounding in love and faithfulness. He didn't want God's faithfulness. He, he, the order he did it was essentially citing this. It's so close that he was essentially citing the covenantal revelation of God to his people on Mount Sinai. It doesn't get any more covenantal than that. And then he's like, but I don't want your faithfulness and love extending to these people. And so when he told God, I'm angry because I know that you're gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in love, he left off faithfulness. I know who you are, but I don't want that part of you to go to them. No, the covenant can't go beyond. You see what I'm saying? So there's this covenantal overtone that was, was my big conclusion. Chris, did you have something you want to say? What was your word study in Jonah? Yeah. So yeah, you know, it was on four saves. Okay. Uh, I also noticed the covenant will overshadow. Oh, come on. Yeah. Uh, maybe I do have something I want to say. So, uh, <laughs> oh. So Jonah uh, is the last time that four saves is used uh, in the Old Testament. And I think it's used a couple of times. Okay. And just so we can track with you, where, where does it say forsaken Jonah? Um, so it actually says forfeit in Jonah. Uh, okay. So I looked it up in a few different translations. Uh, it's in 2.8. Okay, let me read that. 
So in Jonah 2, 8, it says, so Jonah's in the belly of the whale praying, and he says, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to know how somebody could forfeit uh, the, grace, the grace that could be theirs. Okay. Um, Okay. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. How did you kind of land the plane, like with what that means in verse 8? Rephrase the question, please. Yeah. In other words, um, what, what, what does it mean in verse 8, the forfeit or forsake? Yeah. So, um, Tell me more about him throwing it away, if I can press on that a little bit. Yeah. Those who worship worthless idols throw away. Uh, exchange, turn. Um, so forfeit the grace that could be theirs, he says, but I with song and thanksgiving will sacrifice to you. What is it that you want to know? I'm confused. You're saying that Jonah forfeited the grace that could have been his, or I'm trying to understand well, really, what you were saying. It's interesting that it, when I was reading Jonah the first couple of times, I was like, oh, man, Jonah really, it, he changed his heart, and now he's with God, and now he's going to go to the Ninevites and proclaim himself. That's not the posture of Jonah's heart. He's still about himself, I think, even when he's praying in the belly of the whale. He's like, and I'm going to go worship God, you know, and I'm going to do this. But I, I'm, I'm tracking with the general sense that you're, you're following there. I think to me it's like he's he's wrestling with it at this point. Like mm -hmm. he, he, I think he wants to do the right thing here, or at least he is hard pressed enough that he knows that he can't do the wrong thing, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and so he's he's like the, the word forfeit here is yeah. like almost his to me his acceptance of like being away from God's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and and it, it could be kind of talking about the past or maybe it's even he's talking about the Ninevites where it's like those who cling to worthless idols like basically all the pagans 
forfeit grace that could be theirs for me to give to them. Like, he's kind of forfeiting it. He's trying to kind of forfeit it for their sake. Like, he doesn't want to follow through with it kind of thing. So... What do you think about that? It's, it's interesting to follow his journey. Let me, um, I'm going to let you read, you could read the rest of my word study uh, for the Psalms and uh, for Ephesians in your notes. And I would encourage you to do that. I've kind of left the data there. And for these word studies, I actually just did a copy and paste. There was few enough where I actually just put it all put all of the occurrences there well <laughs> for my uh, I actually did forsaken in Psalm 22 funny enough um, my God my God why have you forsaken me but then you could read um, there were 70 occurrences of truth just in the letters of the New Testament so if you look up truth in the whole Bible I wasn't about I didn't have time here's where the liberation comes Dave this is the good news. I didn't have time to do a word study on truth, huge word study. And I didn't even do it in the New Testament as a whole. I did it just, and I didn't even do it in all of the letters of the New Testament, you know, because you've got John and James and stuff. I did it just in Pauline literature, 23 times, because that's all I had time for. I'm telling you that not to say, oh, I failed in my word study. I didn't do it right. Well, what's better for me to do that or no word study? <laughs> I'm trying to tell you, if you don't have time for something, do the best you can, and that can be helpful. You might hold your conclusions lighter, but you also might gain some good insight. So I'll let you read on some of my notes and stuff like that. Yes. We're about to get to that. Yeah. Dave, you're reading my mind, man. I must be more like an engineer than I thought because we're tracking together. So here's some other elements to consider on your journey. Number one is parallel passages. And I've, get, I've written out some examples for you. Um, we, we already went through my first example from Exodus 34 with Jonah 4.2. How did I know that? I knew it because I knew the story of Exodus. I, I didn't look at a note or a study note. It's totally okay for you to do that. Maybe you'll come across a parallel passage in your word study. Uh, a great one for Psalm 22. One is Matthew 27, 46. <coughs> Jesus quotes it. And that's where you can start to move towards theological application. So there's an order here. Okay? Um, and then... A parallel passage may be the Old Testament referent that the New Testament is referencing. So let's say you're in Ephesians 4, 7 through 10, and you're like, what is Paul quoting here? He's quoting Psalm 68, 18. Guess what a great way to understand Ephesians 4, 7 through 10 is? Understand Psalm 68. I will let you uncover the beautiful meaning there. That'll be my teaser. It's a pretty cool parallel passage study. Then, um, if you look in your syllabus again, I've listed, this is your, so we're talking about other elements in your interpretive journey, parallel passages, okay? It's not concept study, it's not word study, it's literally just parallel. Um, you might, in the synoptic gospels, you might go and read, for example, I'm teaching, you might go and read, how, does, how do the other gospel writers talk about this? So, for example, I'm preaching this Sunday on Luke 22, 39 through 62. Well, all four Gospels have some version of that. So I, I, I was looking at that Jesus was in anguish, but Peter and the other disciples praying with him had sorrow. And I was about to contrast Jesus' anguish with the disciples' sadness. But then I read in Matthew that Jesus was also sad and in anguish. So I couldn't make them a culprit. 
interpretively because of a parallel passage where Jesus wasn't, it didn't say that in Luke. It only said it in Matthew. So it helped me add texture to it, okay? Um, but the, another one is historical and cultural background. You're not going to find some of this in the actual Bible, but it can be helpful on your journey. And so there's some, some tools that I've listed. Um, N.T. Wright has a book called New Testament and the People of God. If you read it, I will take you out for a steak dinner. What's that called? Yeah. Yeah. New Testament and the People of God. Um, <laughs> but there are, there are some good historical and cultural background resources. It's on the syllabus. It's on page two of the syllabus. The other historical and cultural background resources that I recommend are in the, in the notes for the very first class session. I list them in detail. Here's historical and cultural ones, here's literary, and here's theological ones. The last step of your research, after you've done your own preliminary literature research, is to study a commentary. But Chad, I don't have time. I don't have time. I got to teach this Sunday. I got to teach this Wednesday. Can I just read the commentary? No. <laughs> yeah. it, it won't be as rich. Do it It'll sound like you read a commentary first. Do your own research with the Holy Spirit and then let someone else speak into it. <laughs> there you go. Yep. Then you'll have a framework for understanding what they say. Then you can interact with the commentators. Because if you're like, but man, I just love R.C. Sproul. Or I just love, you know, this, this commentator. You're going to be really biased towards just whatever they say. You need to do your own work at a literary level. And look to a commentary to bring the theology in, some of those parallel passages, some of that cultural background history. I want you to go to the commentary, but do it after you have context. And then, so now we're, and there, there's whole books written on genre nuances to what we're talking about. I'm not even going to talk about them. I want you to read about them. And that's in Duvall and Hayes. That's in your reading for this. They do a great job of, of digging down into, okay, how do you do these things based on certain genre? Like, you need to interpret Revelation in a certain way that you wouldn't interpret Jonah in the same way. Okay. Um, do good work reading that. If you want to read uh, Gordon D. Fee's book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, he goes down basically the whole Bible at a lay level, like not the scholarly level, but lay level on genre stuff, like Duval and Hayes do. Okay, the pinnacle of interpretation is theology which transitions us from exegesis to application. And so the process goes like this. This is where we are going for next week and where we're going to land. Number one is exegesis of a particular text helps us make theological conclusions. The word exegesis means to draw out. You know exodus? It's the way out. Exegesis is to draw out meaning. Okay? Exegesis of a particular text helps us make theological conclusions. Biblical theology, number two, synthesizes our exegetical findings from Scripture and generalizes our understanding of God through our own poetry, prose, and narrative, through songs, sermons, and stories. In other words, what you start doing at the end once you understand the meaning of a particular text, then you start moving beyond it. And you can say, wow, here's the correlation between Exodus and Jonah and, let's say, New Testament covenantal theology. This is where we go to Psalm 22 and we start understanding Christology. We start understanding how Christ reinterpreted or interpreted Psalm 22. While he was dying, by the way, talk about hermeneutical skill. Goodness. 
being tortured and you're still doing it? He was a little bit into the word. I'll just say that. Um, number three is some of our theological conclusions are principles. An application takes our theological principles and applies them contextually to the world today. So remember, I'm just going to make it real easy to look at. <laughs> or sorry, real quick to draw, not easy to look at. So you've got their town. You've got our town. That's a little weird, OT, but you understand. Our town, their town. And this is the distance between the two, is the river. And what we're doing now, we're only doing now, is crossing the principalizing bridge. Theology is principles about God, in a sense. Now, not just God. Theology can be God's view of people. Okay, you see what I'm saying? So we're looking for principles now. So, uh, you know, the kinds of principles we're drawing out of Jonah, for example, are about God's love. We're making general conclusions. As we look at parallel passages and background and context and concept study and the book study, right? We start making principalizing conclusions. And then... Then we apply. So think about we draw the meaning out of where it was, we theologize, and then we apply. That's how the hermeneutical journey goes. That's how the interpretation journey goes. So your assignment for next week is to do just that. I want you to principalize and apply. Uh, let's see. Oh, it's right here. So this is written in your how to do a book study guide. It's step five. That's what you're doing this week. So you are going to write between 250 to 300 words that include just those elements. In other words, you're, you're synthesizing all your work on just one to three verses. Remember those verses you picked? Remember where your word study is? You're not going beyond that. Just one to three verses. That's it but I want you to apply it. I want you to clearly state your word study, your exegesis, based on your word study, your subsection study, section and subsection study, and your understanding of the theme as a whole. Then I want you to principalize it. What is your primary principle that you're taking out of this? Don't force it, but look for something there. Then apply it to our world today and say, you know, therefore, we should not be <laughs> against Muslims coming to Christ because God loves them too. <laughs> that would be one application, right? But I also want you to apply it to your life. And I want you to write one sentence that says, I will. Because if we do all this study, and it doesn't lead to life change for us, then it's all for naught. And then for those who want feedback, there's a kind of a checklist, you know, go back through, put your whole project together uh, in the kind of deliverables, not all your data and processing, but like your conclusions, your, you know, at the end, what I want you to do kind of in week after we're done with next week, I want you to turn it all in to me if you want feedback on it. So those who are taking credit, for example, will be taking the test. If you want to take the test, the test is your project. And it's pass or fail. If I can see that you really got the how to do a book study, you don't have to do it perfect, but if, if you really understood it in all its parts, and, and I can see you put your effort into it, then you'll get credit for this class. And it's one of 12 classes. And then you can get a certificate in ministry training, and then you're off into the world. There's only one more thing I wanted to talk about. Um, Duval and Hayes do a great job on page 125 in the second edition and talking about preaching and, topic, preaching and teaching dangers to avoid. And one that I think is really important is topical preaching. You can preach topically. I think you can teach topically, but there's a danger with it. And they go and read what they say, but I just want to say, 
Um, the danger is to take short passages, to cite them, and to take them out of context. I think it is the primary danger in the evangelical church today, period. So if you have the opportunity to teach or to preach, please, if you're not sure what the context is, do the work or don't talk about it. it. You don't have to be right about everything all the time. But if you're not sure and you know that, and, oh, that works for my point, and you use it, please don't do that. Please don't do it. It will diminish your ministry and your voice and your power. Don't take verses out of context in your own meditation. Preaching and teaching inside, there's few of us who will do that. Don't take verses out of context in your conversations. If you don't know what it means in context, then don't talk about it. Okay? I'm being kind of intense about it, but it's God's word, man. You want to take me out of context? Go for it, man. More power to you. If you want to take God out of context, woo, buddy. And I'm not saying I've, I've been perfect. I've made mistakes doing that, teaching, evangelizing, teaching, preaching. But, it, but please don't knowingly do it. So make sure you understand the surround, at a minimum, the surrounding literary context before quoting. And at best, you'll understand the book as a whole, the section that you're quoting, and the immediate context. That's a lot of work, isn't it? Few should be teachers. There's a reason for that. All right, so we're moving on. Uh, next week, we're going to have our last session together. I know it's spring break for some of you, but come ready to dive in. I'm going to give some, we'll talk about some fun issues. I also want to bring up some, some like higher level um, how to read the Bible issues in our culture, some philosophy and stuff like that that we'll run into in our day and age. See you guys next week.